well, good evening, everyone. And of course, good morning to our uh, citizens in the US. Uh, as always, thank you for joining and uh, pleasure to have you all. And this, these uh, discussions have been, I think for me, it has been very useful. I continue to learn through questions you ask, comments you make, so continue to do so. Uh, well, as we get into our study this uh, evening, uh, let's request Praveen to request God to be with us as we go through our study and discussion. Let's pray. Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for your provision, protection, and presence in our lives. Especially this moment, Lord, we, we want to thank you for giving us the privilege to gather together with our brethren who are located in various parts of the country and, in fact, various parts of the world, Lord. You brought us together and uh, have given us opportunity to study your word and to discuss and to mutually encourage with our words and edify each other, our Lord. The time we are going to spend in the study, Lord, may be a time that is fruitful to our spiritual life, O God. We may be able to understand you better and experience you in a much profound manner. The words we speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And especially we want to hear your voice through a pastor as he teaches and reveal yourself to us and in us. Thank you so very much for listening to us. We ask for your leading and guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and uh, welcome again. Some of you who have just uh, tuned in. Uh, pleasure to have you all with us. Well, uh, you already hopefully know that subject we're going to discuss because this particular topic has been coming again and again, and I thought maybe we will spend this one session on the subject of predestination. And uh, as I have titled it, predestination, does God decide who should be saved or lost? And obviously that means that, uh, you know, we have absolutely no choice in this. We have no role in it. God has all, everything is predetermined. So that is how uh, you know, there is this confusion that uh, keeps creeping in. Now, interestingly enough, we are doing this study on the heels of another study we did perhaps several weeks back on universalism. Uh, if you recall uh, how we, uh, you know, described universalism, basically it means that all are saved. That is the... Um, the, what do you say, that's how people understand universalism, that everyone will be saved uh, irrespective of, uh, you know, their faith in Jesus or accepting Jesus or repentance and all of those things. Interestingly enough, universalism versus predestination. Predestination, I'm presuming that many believe predestination means that most of them will be damned. Universalism is most of all of them will be saved, but in uh, uh, in uh, predestination, I am presuming that uh, those who very ardently hold to this particular topic, uh, you know, believe that God will damn most of human beings. Only a small uh, elect will be saved. So I just wanted to make that contrast as we move along. Okay. Now, I'm I was just thinking, I just want to make a general comment. Uh, with, the, with the various studies we have been doing uh, of, uh, in the recent past, especially when we start the study of eschatology, uh, the study of last things, it seems to suggest that there is so much we don't know. As we read the scriptures, you know, there, is, there are so many mysteries that still remains uh, unsolved. And, uh, uh, and I think, I hope that all of us have 
the confidence to accept that we don't know all the answers. There are some questions that does not have very explicit answers in the scriptures. And for that, to that extent, we may have to wait. But even as I say that, on the other hand, what we know perhaps is becoming clearer and clearer. There are mysteries on one side, but on the other side, I think there are certain things absolutely, what you say, uh, you know, crystal clear in terms of the scriptures. I hope that we can take, uh, you know, confidence uh, in uh, the fact that there are things that we know very, very clearly from the scriptures. And in this respect, the Apostle Paul makes a very interesting comment. And I just want to go to that before we get into the subject proper. And I'll share my screen and uh, I will have scriptures to, to sort of show you. Uh, uh, this is the title that uh, we are using for today. But the scripture I want to read is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1. Uh, notice it says, uh, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Interesting, Paul himself talks about the mysteries of God. And in verse 2, he says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful, faithful in teaching these mysteries. But notice what he says, I'm dropping down to verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to the light the hidden things of darkness and reveals the counsels of the heart. Now, these comments are in the context of how these people are probably judging Paul and Apollos. But we can also recognize that Paul is, uh, you know, accepting the fact that there are some things that we might not know until the Lord comes. So to that extent, there, it remains a mystery. Continuing on, he says, then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, verse 6, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. And I thought, uh, those uh, uh, that, that last highlighted words are interesting. He says, we must learn not to think beyond what is written. Now, what does he mean by that? I'm presuming that he is basically trying to say, don't, uh, you know, overanalyze certain things which we don't fully have the answers to. All right. In other words, don't get obsessed with certain topics or subjects or questions that might not be fully revealed to us. They may remain mysteries, right? So Paul himself is accepting the fact that, you know, let's be patient and wait for the Lord to come to reveal all of these things. And I'm presuming that, you know, this subject of predestination is like that uh, because uh, there, are, there, are, there is some ambiguity there in, in terms of the scriptures. So we must be careful about that. If I can uh, use my Hyderabadi Hindi, you know, when Paul is saying, don't overanalyze or don't get obsessed, uh, perhaps he's basically trying to say, Are, dimak, dimak karab mat karo yaar, son son <laughs> I, I hope uh, that resonates with you. I somehow like the way it's done in Hyderabad Hindi, right? So let us not karab our dimak by too much over analysis. All right. Having said that, uh, let's get into the subject by itself, right? Now, the subject of predestination, election uh, has been discussed since the Reformation. That when was the Refor when did the Reformation take place? According to what I could find, October 15, 1517. <laughs> that is more than 500 years back, right? Uh, that's the day on which uh, uh, in when, uh, when Luther, Martin Luther challenged the Roman Catholic Church with the 95 Thesis. 
This subject of the predestination has been discussed from those times. So we are not going to solve this in the one hour that we spent together today. This will be a continuing discussion. This will be a continuing conversation. And uh, thankfully, God will reveal to us what we need to know. Uh, many times what we try to do is we try to stack up scriptures. We stack up scriptures on one side. The other side will uh, stack up another set of scriptures. And then we try to you know, prove our point. Uh, but yet the ambiguity remains. So my task today is not to go through the vast subject of predestination, but I'm going to pick up just a few thoughts, hopefully will be helpful for us to clarify our position, uh, the way we think in especially uh, the GCI uh, denomination. Uh, so my, my uh, you know, attempt will be to be very selective. And obviously you may have many questions about it uh, because the subject is, uh, you know, so large that obviously we cannot complete it in uh, just one sitting. Now, as we get into the subject, one important point to note, and that is the, the both sides, both sides of the argument, they are both trying to be sincere. And in other words, what I'm trying to say is we should not uh, you know, assume or impute wrong motives to any side. Uh, both sides are trying to explain it in the way they are able to see it in scripture. So uh, sometimes one scripture seems to be so convincing that predestination is what God, uh, where God will choose who should be saved and who should be damned. But on the other side, some will say, no, God doesn't choose. It is we who choose. You can bring scriptures on both sides to make it you know, fairly convincing. And that is the reason why we have to embrace the element of mystery uh, in this particular subject. Okay, let me then bring you, I'm presuming, let's see, I think I'm going to bring you three important points with regards to this subject. One is predestination is very clearly taught in scripture, right? There is no doubts about it. The question is, what is the meaning of predestination or how does, how is the word predestination used in the scriptures? There is uh, absolutely no doubts about the fact that it is mentioned and taught in the scriptures. Now, let me take out one scripture and do a little analysis here. Once again, I, I cannot exegete the whole thing, but um, I will... Uh, just uh, bring in some thoughts on this. And the scripture is Romans 8 and verse 29. What does it say? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, moreover, he, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we... I think this is one verse we use very often when we talk about predestination. So very clearly in verse 29, he says, he also predestined. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So pre predestination as a concept is definitely in the scriptures. But notice the first part, whom he foreknew. What is this referring to? The camp that says God chooses who he, who he should save immediately assumes that uh, only a few are foreknown. And I think that is a fallacy. That is not correct. Whom he foreknew, uh, it does not say he only foreknew a few or the elect. So whom he foreknew is a very broad uh, reference. And it is difficult for us to say that this assumes only a few, right? Another point with regards to this, foreknowledge, for, for new or foreknowledge is not for determination. I think we have to make that distinction. 
right? The distinction between foreknowledge and foreordination, foreknowing is not foredetermining or for uh, deciding or foreordination. In this respect, I am going to appeal to John Wesley, uh, the famous, uh, you know, theologian and pastor, and of course, uh, uh, a man of God. Notice what John Wesley says. I take it from one of his uh, articles. Uh, and follow me as I go along with this. Ha Notice how John Wesley puts this. John Wesley says, God knows that man sins, for he knows all things. Yet, we do not sin because he knows it. Do you understand what he's saying? Just because God knows man will sin, does not make man to sin. God is not making man to sin, in other words. All right? So foreknowledge of the fact that man can sin is not foredetermination. God has not determined for man to sin. Okay? That distinction, I think, is what John Wesley is trying to bring here. It goes on to say, but he knows it because we sin. And his knowledge supposes our sin, but here is very uh, an important point, but does not in any wise cause it. God is not causing people to sin just because he knows they will sin. All right? I hope you can catch the distinction. Uh, let's finish the quote. In a word, God looking on all ages from the creation to the consummation, consummation is the very end, as a moment and seeing at once whatever is in the hearts of all children, of men knows, here is again a very important point, knows everyone that does or does not believe. In other words, God in his omniscience knows who will believe and who might not believe in every age or nation. Yet what he knows, whether faith or unbelief, is, not, is in no way caused by his knowledge. That's what is important. He is not causing them to disbelieve. The disbelief is coming from, not from him, just because he knows it, all right? So he concludes by saying, men are free in believing or not believing as if he did not know it at all. I hope you catch the point there. Uh, if you should have a question, uh, you know, you can ask. But here, another important point, I'll go back to the previous uh, scripture, uh, or rather slide. It says, we are, uh, uh, we, we discussed whom he foreknew. Now notice it says, he also predestined. Predestined for what? To be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, predestination here is about what we are to become. It is not about who is to be elected or chosen. That is not as much as we can understand. And of course, I'm putting a lot of scriptures also together here. Predestination is about what he wants humans to become. It is not about who should be selected. Okay, so that's the distinction that uh, I would like to make here. So this basically reveals God's heart. So I'm going to leave that there. If you should have a thought or question or a comment, you can come back to that. All right. Um, let me then move on to another point, my second point. And the, this, is, this point is, or I put it in the form of a question, did Jesus die for all, all humanity, or only for some? Is Jesus' death available, applicable only for a few, because this comes from the uh, Calvinistic thought of limited atonement. You know, you must have heard about that. Once again, I'm not going to go into uh, the, you know, the whole uh, Calvinistic uh, teaching, but they say Christ's atonement on the cross is limited only to those who are elected or to be saved. Uh, some, some people use this uh, verse, Jesus' death is sufficient for all the world 
but efficient only for the elect. All right. Basically meaning God has predetermined who will be saved and who his death will apply to and the rest of them are damned. Okay. But that is not what I, uh, uh, you know, that is not how I would conclude because I want to show you two scriptures now. Once there are many more, but I'm just going to go through these two scriptures and they are on your screen. One John two, let's read them. Verse two says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The word propitiation is basically meaning sacrifice that atones for our sins, right? He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. But here is the point. Atones for whom? Right? He's propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, does that make it clear that Christ died for all of humanity? In other words, all of humanity are included in Christ's death. I don't think we can get around that. Okay, let's look at the second scripture, 2 Peter chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. You probably already recognize what I'm going to uh, uh, you know, uh, emphasize. And it is highlighted in yellow. Who bought them? Who did he buy? That is a metaphor for the fact that his atonement uh, is applicable to uh, all of these people. He has purchased them by his, with his blood, right? So what does he say? Who will see, uh, uh, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be pro false prophets among you, who will secretly bring destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. In other words, those who deny Jesus and will bring destruction on themselves are included in the sacrifice of Jesus. He has purchased them with his blood. So to say that Jesus died only for the elect is not biblically correct from these scriptures that I read. So in other words, there is no predetermination in terms of how whom Jesus will die for. He dies for all of humanity. All right. That's my second point. And I'm going to bring in my third point. Uh, this will maybe take a, just a little longer and then we will conclude uh, to bring in some discussions. My third point is the, this concept of election. Right. Uh, we read in the scriptures that, uh, you know, God elects or God chooses. We talk about the elect of God. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, the chosen ones. All right. And uh, the logical view when we talk about election is election would mean logically to choose some and reject the others. So logically speaking, I'm just going to take off this uh, from the screen so I can see you all. All right. So the logical view of election is choose one or choose some and reject the others. In other words, the log logically we understand election to be to choose to exclude others and to include just a few. That is how we understand. But the biblical view I would like to say is uh, different. The biblical view is the election is not to exclude. The election is to include. And let me uh, give you a few scriptures to help you understand that. Where did the whole election process start? Of course, uh, we know uh, the election started much before, but I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, chronologically from the scriptures. Uh, and we know that Abraham was the first person to be chosen as such, very clearly written. And uh, let me then, uh, uh, I think I've got that on the screen, if I can just bring that scripture up. Yes, Genesis chapter 12. 
uh, it says the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All right. Now, why was Abraham chosen? Why was he elected? So that indeed he will become a great nation. Right. Uh, his name will be great. But for what purpose? So that Abraham will be put on a pedestal and everybody can say, wow, 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 what a great man he is. For what purpose? And I think the purpose is given very clearly so that all peoples on the earth will be blessed. But you might say, well, what about the cursing? You know, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, he's going to curse a few. Well, the curse is for the rejection. I will bless those who bless you, curse. And whoever curses you, I will curse. In other words, those who are cursed are not predetermined to curse Abraham. His God's, uh, uh, what do you say, purpose for election or choosing Abraham is so that all peoples, all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So election is, the, is for the sake of inclusion. Now, let's move forward then. And uh, I don't have these scriptures on, what, which I'm going to read now on the screen. So I'll read it for you. From Abraham... The nation of Israel was chosen. All of us know that. But what was the choice for Israel? Why was Israel chosen as a elect nation? Let me read you from Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. This is Deuteronomy chapter 7. The Lord your God has chosen you, Israel, uh, nation of Israel, out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people his treasured possession. Now notice verse 7. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. Right? And it continues on. But I'll stop there. So Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, Israel is a chosen nation, elected. Now, chosen, why? Because uh, they were they, uh, you know, better than the others. What God is saying is there was nothing special about you. When he says, uh, uh, I did not choose you because you were no more numerous, but basically saying there was nothing special about you that I had to choose you. I chose you not because of you. I chose you because of who I am. Isn't that lovely song that we sing? Uh, not because of us, but because of who you are, who you are, right? It's the Lord's love that makes the choosing. And who does he love? Well, John 3.16 says, who does he, who he loves, right? So, Unfortunately, and maybe it is necessary for us to mention this, this, this chapter or this verse sometimes is taken to think that, or rather including other verses, to think that, oh, Israel as a nation was a race that was superior to the other races. Did you know that there are some who actually say that? They say that a certain class of people are superior. Uh, and they use such scriptures. And that is how they misrepresent the Bible to justify racism. And that is how the slave trade started. It's so unfortunate that uh, they don't see some of the very important things that are written. Uh, I'll also read Exodus 19 and verse 5. It says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations... You will be my treasured possessions. But for what purpose? Out of all nations, you shall be my treasured possessions. But here is the catch. 
although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Did you notice that? A kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? A priest mediates. Right? A priest is a mediator between people and God. So in other words, as a nation, they were a kingdom of priests. So their treasured status was not so that they could blow their own trumpets and say, what a great people we are. Their treasured status is to fulfill a mediatory role so that they would be a blessing for others. Going back to the prophecy that God gave Abraham, that he chose him so that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So from this one man, Abraham, through his family, and now through a nation, he wanted the whole nations to be blessed. Let me read you one more uh, reference in this regard, and then I'll move to uh, the important point I want to make. I want to also read Deuteronomy chapter 4, and uh, beginning in verse 5, it says, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it, once again showing the special status of Israel. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. Don't uh, miss that. Observe them carefully. For what reason? So they can thump their chest and say, I am a great person? No. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. They will say, what other nation is so great to have their God near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. They go on to say, and what other nation is so great so as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today. Why do these nations say that? They look at Israel and say, how, what a great nation you are. What a, what a privileged nation you are that you have your God so close to us. Why would they say that? They say that because they want to emulate them. They want to be part of them. They want to be blessed like them. That is why they say it. What is the point of saying it? And then they go and live in their misery all over again. Right? They are saying it so that they can become part of a treasured people like Israel. Okay, so I hope I've proved my point that Abraham was chosen not for exclusion or excluding others, but for including all the nations of the earth. Israel was chosen so that they could be a kingdom of priests mediating God's love to the others. So the others would say, we want to be like you. We want to have God as our God, as you are, you know, your God as your God. And that's what Ruth says, right? Your God is my God. Your people are my people. That's the whole purpose, right? Now, now let's come to the important point. Why is this election of Abraham in Israel important for us to know? Or this election, the whole concept of election, did it start with Abraham and Israel? And that is where I think now we come to the main point. You see, an election took place before the election of Abraham and uh, Israel as a nation. There was a primary election that took place, if I can use those, those phrase, that phrase. There was a person elected. And who is this person? Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. I may have that on my screen. Let me just check. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have that on my screen, so I will just, uh, I'll just read it for you. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, or elect one, elected one, my chosen one, or the elect one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. 
Do you know it's who is talking about? Who is this reference to? I'm sure you all understand and know, right? Very clearly, if you read the following verses, this is Isaiah 42. If you read the following verses, the identity is absolutely clear. It is the Messiah. And who is the Messiah? Jesus Christ, our Lord. So who is the elect? Who is the primary elect? Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is he who is the elect. And in him, the election begins to unfold so that uh, he will bring justice to all the nations. And in that respect, I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a verse that I'm sure you all know. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 21 says, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of all the dead comes also through a man. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all, uh, all will be made alive. Notice, Christ was chosen. This is obviously talking about Christ, right? Christ was chosen to represent all of sinful humanity. All of sinful humanity who die. Now, in him, he makes the same all to be made alive. So the elect is finally Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, we are told. Notice it says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, for he chose us in him. So let us uh, recognize that our election is uh, a, a later, you know, uh, what do you say, occurrence after the primary election. It was in him we are chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So, how did, how, on what basis did he predestine us? In love. And I can ask the question, whom did he love? John 3.16 says he loved the whole world. It doesn't say, and for God so loved the elect. Does it say that? No. It says, God so loved the world, right? Secondly, it says predestined. In, in love, he predestined, now for what? For adoption. Proves the point again, which I proved earlier. It is Predestination is about what is to happen to humanity, not a particular person being chosen. Predestination is about the entire gamut of God's love for humanity. Right? And if you go back to John 3.17, it also says predestination is not for condemnation. So God doesn't choose some to be condemned. Because John 3, 7 very clearly says that. He came to the world not to condemn, right? But to save humanity. Uh, so predestination, in my understanding, is not an arbitrary decision that God makes as to who should be the goat and who should be the sheep. That is not what predestination is all about. Predestination is about what God wants for humanity. And that's why Christ was chosen and his choosing is, and our choosing is in his chosenness, in him, that we then become, uh, you know, have access to the wonderful predest pre predestined, you know, future that we can look forward to. Okay, I think uh, the time has just gone by. Uh, and uh, I think I'll stop there. I had... Uh, a parable to read, but I won't, uh, I won't get into that at this time. So let me get back to the screen, right? The floor is open for your comments, questions. Please uh, go ahead and uh, come along. Yes, David, you had a thought? Yeah, I'm... Um... I was just uh, going through, uh, I mean, uh, Romans chapter 9. Uh, uh, verses. Uh, verses 13 and 14. 
Romans yeah. chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. It says, uh, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. So just wanted to have clarity on that. Okay. Yes, this is another one of those, uh, man, uh, uh, not a, you know, verse that, you know, uh, screws your head a bit. But you see, once again, the way I answer it will be like this. Uh, verse 13 says, as a resident, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. It, it, it presupposes that God hates people. Now, nowhere in the scriptures, I, I, uh, I can conclude that God hates people. All right. For example, uh, in Luke chapter, I don't remember, is it chapter 14 where it says that we must hate our father and mother, our brothers and sisters, our children. Is God telling us to hate our family? No. So the word hate, I think, should be understood in its context. I believe, and I think, you know, most, uh, you know, uh, scholars would look at it from this perspective, uh, that when God says, uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau I hated, he is talking about preference. He's not talking about literally hatred. He preferred one for a particular reason. And he preferred one over the other. So the preference does not mean he has rejected or hated Esau that he is going to be damned to hell. I don't see that, right? So when God says that I have loved Jacob, in other words, he is basically under, you know, I mean to say, uh, uh, declaring that the preference was for Jacob to be the elect so that in him, the promises will be fulfilled right up to, you know, through Christ. Do, does that make sense, David? Yeah, of course. Uh, because uh, if you see uh, the origin of God, God is love. Uh, the very essence of God is love. And uh, uh, he, he loves us supremely in the sense of unconditional love. And here there is uh, a bit of uh, jiggling of the words. Actually. Right. And uh, it, because God first loved us, then we are, in fact, uh, rather learning to love him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. Uh, if, if I see that in that context, then I can see, uh, I can understand that. Uh, uh, and another part which I was wanting to share was God is incomprehensible. You have, you have not perceived his... <laughs> Uh, is unlimited, unbound. So uh, that's another reason where uh, I I can say that I still am learning. I'm a I'm a martetos. I am a disciple. So <laughs> yes, David. <laughs> that's all, what I said earlier. All, uh, <laughs> I, I talked about the mystery, and the Apostle Paul talks about the exactly. mystery. And we exactly. there are there are things that we need to wait for the Lord to reveal to us. Exactly, and uh, I need to identify myself, uh, humble myself. Right. of the Lord so that he will reveal in his own time what yeah. are the secrets which belongs to right. him. Thank right. you very much, uh, Pastor. It was really wonderful. All right. I think Suri Murthy had a comment to make. Suri Murthy, I saw your hand going up. If you can unmute yourself if you are talking. Uh, there are two points. Uh, we had learned in earlier times that Jesus was not hated, Jesus was loved less. <laughs> that should have been the translation. Okay. Point number two, why should God love him less? Why should there be a preference? Okay. <laughs> is that your question? Uh, why should there be a preference? First is uh, an observation. Yes. Second is a question. Yeah. See, once again, uh, when uh, when you uh, when you uh, look at the concept of election, the election is a preference. You know, when you go to the voting machine, you will elect one, and which means you're excluding others. But that's not what the Bible is helping us to understand. Election is 
is actually an inclusion. So when you say preference for one, does not necessarily mean he is going to get less. Uh, uh, Esau was also blessed, and he and Esau became a great nation uh, himself to the descendants. And today we can see that, <laughs> right? So a preference is not uh, for uh, you know a second class citizen. Esau didn't become a second class citizen. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female in the kingdom. There are no second class citizens. We are all, you know, sons and daughters of God. Bertie, you had a thought. Uh, you need to unmute, Bertie. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's, it says, mentioned somewhere in the Old Testament scriptures, in the prophets, uh, that uh, you are the, uh, I'm the potter, you are the clay. And... Uh, it says, oh, it may be in the New Testament writing. Does yeah. the, can the clay, uh, where God mentions, does not he have the right to make the, uh, you know, to the potter does not have the right to, you know, to make the clay, some for noble use and some for ignoble use. And uh, can the clay say to the potter, why have you made me thus? Uh, can that throw some light? <laughs> where, where the God so it says that I'm the potter, I make things, you know, and I have the right. And, uh, you know, he is a just God. He is a loving, faithful God and true. Okay. And he, so uh, uh, maybe that throws some light uh, on the matter. Okay. The way I look at that, uh, Bertie, is this, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, let's take a potter who makes pottery. Now, he, he makes some pots, you know, to be vases. He makes some pots to be a uh, flower beds or whatever. He makes different types of pottery, all right? So he, as the potter, can decide what he wants to make. The, the, the pot cannot tell the potter, why did you make me a vase? Why don't you make something else? But here is the point. The potter doesn't make pottery, put some on your know, fantastic display and say, oh, these are beautiful. All the other pots I made, I will take a stick and damn them and break them. Does he do that? I mean, the potter should be mad to do that. And yet that is what we are assuming that God does. That he creates human beings and then damns them to hell. <laughs> I mean, God is not a nutcase. Like, you know, uh, we, we, understand, should, we understand clearly. God creates so that he blesses. It's an overflowing of his love. Just as a potter would create and does not destroy a part of his creation. He has, a, he has a blessed and faithful plan. Okay. Uh, is it Rekha or Anil? I can't see whose hand is that. Potter's house. <laughs> okay. Uh, unmute yourself, uh, Rekha. Just to add to this, I just thought of Isaiah 45, 7. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So he does both good and evil, light and darkness, because he is the creator. And, and how uh, do you know good if you don't know evil? Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> well, I suppose we have to be very careful how we how we interpret that. You know, when you know we can uh, run away with that and think that God creates evil, then God is then a party to all the evil in the world. Can you say that God is the is the author of rape? Can we say that? God is the author of, uh, you know, uh, all the atrocities that take place. We can't say that. So I think uh, reading that scripture, yes, uh, it is proving the omnipotence of God, the sovereignty of God, that nobody can challenge God. But we have to be careful that we understand it in a way where we don't try to think that God is the author of evil where he becomes party to everything that is bad in the world. Maybe we should study that a little bit more carefully. Anybody has a thought on that? Uh, I, I did not get into that scripture today. Yes, uh, sorry, Murti, go ahead. Uh, you're, uh, you're muted. Uh. One of those difficult stories in the Bible. <laughs> uh, 
God took Zedekiah and his sons to the king of Babylon. And before Zedekiah's own eyes, the king killed both his sons. And God said he would do that. And he also ensured, God also ensured, he said that he ensured that King of Babylon put his eyes out. So difficult to understand. Yes, yes. Uh, go back to what I said earlier. For knowledge is not for determination or for, you know, in other words, the fact that God knew that this person would be such a horrible person uh, does not mean God is the one who is perpetrating this act. He knew that this person is capable of that. So his knowledge doesn't contribute to that sin. For example, it, I think in Exodus or is it, uh, you know, in one of those books, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You remember reading that? Yes. Now, does it mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and that he made him a horrible person? Uh, no. If you, if you go back and read the whole story, it, con it repeatedly says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, his own heart. Many, many times, more number of times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. In other words, when God says God hardened his heart, it is something that God knows Pharaoh would do. He has foreknowledge that Pharaoh would do that. See, that's the kind of a person Pharaoh was. It doesn't mean to say God is the one engineering that hardening of the heart. That's how I look at it. Right? <laughs> Any thoughts? David, yes, go ahead. Uh, it's not a, a thought of continuity, but uh, I mean, Romans 9 is so, <laughs> so big chapter as such to understand many things. Each verse is absolutely a mystery, actually. <laughs> uh, verse 15, um, and uh, uh, 16 and 17, you can just uh, read to. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Um, and I will uh, have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my uh, name might be declared throughout all the earth. Yeah. So once again, I guess uh, we go back to that, <laughs> uh, taking this verse, right, and uh, finding the difficulty there. You know, one point I'd like to bring out and uh, which might help us, you know, uh, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, in V and GCI uh, definitely, uh, you know, try to follow that scripture must inform our theology but simultaneously, our theology must inform scripture. In other words, scripture must, uh, you know, help us form our theology and our theology must help us understand scripture. So when you recognize the theology of God and the God and who God is, like you yourself said earlier, in terms of the big picture of who God is, if you try to fit in these verses there, you will then begin to understand that you cannot conclude that God is such an arbitrary God that I will show mercy, whom I am mercy, who kon hai, you know, baat karne ka, my, my, you know, uh, you know, mera jurisdiction. That is not the God we worship. You know, the way he is saying it or the, or the reason he's saying it is once again, in my understanding, is a, you know, a, you cannot challenge God uh, and you cannot challenge his justice. He cannot challenge his love. 
His love is unlimited. Just because he says, I will show whom I will show mercy on, doesn't mean to say he's going to be, you know, absolutely, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bad on certain other people. No. So our theology of who God is should inform how we should read that scripture. Does it make sense? Anyone like to contribute to that? Yes, Anil, go ahead. Sir. No, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, God is working out his purpose here on earth, right? right? And these bad, good, evil, and all that, he allows this towards his purpose because he even sometimes or you know, uh, uses the bad or evil to finally some good to come out of it. So I think uh, it, it, that doesn't mean that God produces evil and he makes people to do uh, bad, but he uses, he allows it, but he uses that for his final purposes. Absolutely, uh, Anil. What uh, I would say is all of this helps us to understand this whole concept of pred uh, predestination. It shows that God has given us the faculty of being able to make choices. And we make choices and sometimes most of our choices are bad. But God is not limited. Even though we make bad choices, God is still able to redeem us in spite of the bad choices we make. So that is, you know, uh, like you said, uh, he can accomplish everything for his wonderful purpose. So he's not limited there. Vanessa, you had a thought? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what I wanted to know is that uh, in the Bible, we keep reading and we, uh, we get to know that uh, God punishes, God gives curses. And uh, I mean, he does the good, he does the bad and uh, so many things that God can do. But when Jesus, he sent his son, Jesus... In the whole time that Jesus was on earth, he, he never cursed anyone. He never did any wrong. He, he had always forgiven. He had always cured and done the good. So why when his son came to earth, his son did only good? And why in the Bible they keep talking about God curses and God rained down fire and this, this happened and that happened. So yeah. why, why is this difference there? Okay, I think you touched upon another very important point, and that is a, a misnomer that exists, that God the Father is a cruel uh, monster, and Jesus is the, you know, the, you know, the lovely shepherd who was, who made to change God's, God the Father's mind, you know, that is how sometimes Chris, uh, some Christians tend to picture God, but you know, who is Jesus? <laughs> You know, I can, if I can just read you what Hebrews chapter one says, right? Uh, and I'll just begin in verse two. In the la last days, he has spoken to us by his son, God, I am presuming the father, uh, appointed him heir of all things. Now, who is the son? The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his power. In other words, Jesus and the Father are the one, are one in their love for humanity. <laughs> God the Father is, God is not shielding us against the Father's wrath or anger. That is how we picture God. But that is a false, that is a, actually a heresy. God the Father's love for humanity is the same as his love is for Jesus Christ himself and Jesus love for Jesus was the exact representation of God. He came to reveal the father. So uh, don't, uh, I mean to say, don't fall for that wrong interpretation to think that the father is the monster and Jesus is the poor shepherd and, you know, and or not shepherd, but the sheep and the father had to crush him so that his wrath would be fulfilled. You know, I mean, that, that is, that's a wrong picture to get. Does it help, Vanessa? I, I, you're looking a little non nonplussed. <laughs> yes, uh, Surya Murthy, go ahead. Unmute, Surya Murthy. Um, 
when you read the Old Testament, we always hear about God saying, I will punish you, I will punish you, I will punish you. Right. When you come to the New Testament, we always hear, I will forgive you, I will forgive you, <laughs> I will forgive you. So this is the basic thing with which we struggle. At least I struggle. Yeah. Yes, it, it, the, see, that is the dichotomy. And I think that is where, uh, like I said earlier, when we have studied the scriptures, we have seen who God is, you know, the, the whole, the, the question of who God is, when we settle that in our minds, when we recognize the theology there, that should inform how we read these scriptures. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't bring a schizophrenic God. That is what Christians sometimes do. We think God is a, is a schizophrenic. He was like this in the Old Testament and he is totally different in the other. He, as though he's a split personality. That is not true. I mean, then, then how can you worship a God whom you don't know what he's going to do next? <laughs> I mean, if you're not assured of God's love for you, you, are go you will be miserable <laughs> You know, and, and literally fearful. Anil, you had a thought on that? Uh, uh, just uh, following from Surya's uh, question. The Old Testament was a, a, a law based on law. You know, their whole life, life was governed by law. Whereas the New Testament is a grace economy. I mean, here it's Jesus' grace that, that is seen us through. So that's why we see a whole lot of... Uh, you know, uh, fire and brimstone in the Old Testament and uh, all love and grace in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean that God is a fearful and a cruel God. That's what I want to say. Yes, yes. I think uh, I, if I remember well, Praveen, you had a, you had a, you know, a message on how to read the scriptures and through the eyes and the lens of, you know, uh, Jesus. Uh, I don't know if you, if you. Uh, you know, how to read these scriptures as a whole. Uh, you, do you want to comment on that? Or maybe you can do a Bible study on that. <laughs> right. But if you want to make a comment or two, go ahead. Uh, definitely we'll discuss about that subject. Perhaps uh, we better stick to the topic today. Okay. That would be better, I feel. And uh, uh, if our members have time for five minutes, I would like to bring a few points. Otherwise, uh, we can close, and as we are doing, uh, like you know, after that we can continue the conversation, uh, which may which may be a continuation of what you have said. Okay. Uh, uh, if anyone has a pressing uh, need to go, uh, shall we close here? We can pray and close it. Otherwise, those who would like to stay, Praveen has some thoughts to share with us. Uh, raise your hands. Anyone who wants to. I have to leave. I have a, I okay. have a nine thirty appointment kind of thing. Sure, sure. I'll tell you what the Rekha knowledge. Stay. Yeah. Oh, Rekha stay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, what I uh, what I would uh, recommend okay. is anyone who has uh, you know have to leave, please feel free to leave, and then uh, we will close once Praveen finishes. Go ahead, Praveen. <clears throat> yeah. The topic we are discussing now is about uh, pre predestination and about election. And some of the points we have brought forth and I will, I will comment on the questions we have brought, uh, like uh, David brought about uh, he, J Jacob I loved and Isha I hated these verses are there. When we talk about election and if you see the pattern in the Bible, it is quite different. For us, we most of the times when we talk about predestination and election, we think God has elected us for salvation only. Uh, so which is the benefit that we are going to receive? But the pattern we see in the Old Testament is like is not like that. The pattern we find in the Old Testament is God elected somebody for others. In other, in other words, one scripture, one example we have discussed was the story of Abraham. Abraham was not just elected for himself. Definitely Abraham reaped the benefits of being elected and being obedient to God. But the purpose was mentioned at the end of all the promises that is through you, I'm going to bless all the nations. So this election is not for Abraham. This election is for others. 
So the question people are asking about Jacob and Eshau, the answer is this. Jacob I loved and I elected for Eshau. Who is hated now? Jacob was elected for Eshau. Just this promise, uh, this election of Jacob cannot be taken outside the context of Abrahamic covenant. Jacob's election should be understood under the umbrella of Abrahamic covenant. That's number one. And uh, the second point also is a continuation of uh, the same thought. Uh, that is like, you know, if you read the Old Testament to the New Testament, Abraham was chosen and elected for others. And, but unfortunately, Israelites, though they were elected for the sake of others, they started excluding people. They started uh, saying, this God is only God of Israel. He said, uh, he is the God of Israel. Who said, oh, God is the God of Israel? Uh, Israelites, they said that. Oh, God is the God of universe, whole universe. And they called himself God of Israel. So they wanted to limit and they did not let Gentiles to enter in the temple. Okay. So they excluded people. So they thought this special election is separately something for them. And do you believe during the time of Jesus Christ, the, the Jewish people and especially the Pharisees were very strongly believing that salvation is only for Jews. Salvation is not for Gentiles. And unfortunately, the same thing creeped into Christianity. The first, in the beginning of the book of Acts, we find that the uh, disciples did not go out of Jerusalem and Jewish nations. They wanted and they were sharing gospel only to the Jews because they also believed the salvation is only for Jews. And we find in Acts chapter 12 where God reveals the plan to Peter and we all know the incident very well. And uh, during the when he went, uh, when he goes to Cornelius' house, when the Holy Spirit descended, then he says, Now I realize God hears the prayers of non Jewish people also. In, then, since then, they realize the gospel uh, is for Gentiles also, salvation is for Gentiles also. Then the disciples realize God did not choose Israel only for. The, to keep to select some people and save them and keep him keep them for himself. No, God chose these people so that through them he may take the gospel to the entire world. In other words, he chose this group of people to bless other nations. So the election of God should be understood always in the light of his very nature. Our God is an other-centered person. Our God is an other-centered God. Father loves the son, son loves the father. They don't love their self. He doesn't say father loves himself. And he keeps something things for himself. He freely gives things to the son. And son freely gives things to us. So always, God, God, the works of God always go along with the nature of God. The God we believe is a triune God and his nature is other-centered. And whatever he does, he does for others. So when we talk about election also, we have to understand that his nature is imprinted even in this act. That is God elected you and me for others. So whatever Jewish people have done with the temple and the God and the early church uh, did keeping the gospel to themselves. And unfortunately, from 15th century or 16th century, we started doing the same. And we are calling it so-called reformation. From then, we are keeping the salvation to ourselves. God elected and saved me. And for what? So that I may go to heaven. No, it is not about that. God elected you and I so that he may take his salvation to people. So that we have to, as Christians, we need to understand. And we should never, ever think our election is for ourselves. But our election is always for others. That is one, one of the main points we need to understand because that is the Trinitarian understanding of election. And the next thing we also need to understand is God does what he does in himself, through himself, by himself, in which he is all sufficient God. When God elects, he doesn't elect you and I, he elects through his son, Jesus. So God did not elect Jesus also for himself. God elected his son, Jesus, 
then in Ephesians it is written, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Whom did he choose? He chose Christ in him who, who? all of us. So here also it is other center thing. We understand. And one more point I would like to let you know, a very simple point that can help us in so much of fight in this uh, regarding this topic. The word predestination is a word for people who knew God. It is not for the people, word. it's not, it's a word not for the people who do not know God. In simple word. If you know God and if you accepted him, this word is for you. And if you did not, if this word is not for others to understand. This is one of the mysteries. So people who are given the ability to act, understand his mysteries, grace, and for them only this word. That's one of the things we need to take. Another thing is, when we talk about predestination, we're talking so much about going to heaven or they being damned in hell. But this is even a serious subject. This predestination talks about human freedom. We talk about God had given us the ability to choose. Okay, so this is another argument comes regarding predestination. One thing we need to realize, whatever the freedom we are given, we are given under the sovereignty of God. And we are never given a free will. Kindly uh, don't misunderstand my words. Okay, because I'm going to explain. Uh, we are not given free will, but we are given free choice. For Adam also, God gave a choice. Eat it, not eat it. That is a choice. Within that frame only, we have, he has to choose. For us also, within that frame only, we have to choose. So we have a, we call it so, we call it so-called human will, freedom, uh, freedom of will. That is not something we, we are experiencing it completely. And we are not given. I don't have the freedom to choose where I can born. It is limited. That freedom is limited. So we are given a frame on which we have to make our choices. So in which uh, the human freedom of choosing God works under the sovereignty of God. And this, when you talk about the sovereignty of God, and we should never ever understand he is sovereign. That's why he has to exercise his sovereignty. God is sovereign, but he is not slave to his sovereignty. He, it is his wish. He can, he wants to exercise or not. And we, what is the example we can see? God is all powerful. In Jesus, willingly, he humbled himself to come under human power and to be punished by humans. In such a way, God works. So it is a mystery where the sovereignty of God and human choice, they work together where we are chosen uh, and we are elected. And in this election and this cho chosen, uh, this, uh, this being chosen is not for ourselves, but it is for others in which the nature of God would be reflected in and through our lives. So in short form, I would like to bring this, uh, actually even there are few other stuff uh, we have to discuss when you talk about predestination. Predestination is a predetermination is there. And uh, uh, these words, how we have to connect it to Old Testament scriptures and what Paul had in his mind. Paul is the only person who talks about the mysteries of God. How is he connecting that? Maybe if you have time later, we can do that. Otherwise, uh, Google these words or try to find uh, resources where you can get this. So these are some of the comments I would like to make uh, in a very short I don't know if it's short. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Praveen. I think uh, it's good to have uh, some of those clarifications done. But like I said, this is a huge subject. But thank you for staying back. Let's uh, pray. Uh, let me lead you in a closing prayer and then uh, we will uh, conclude. Thank you, gracious Father, for this evening. And thank you for my brothers and sisters uh, for the discussion we've had and the desire that we have to learn in learning. We know there are mysteries. Uh, there are certain things beyond our comprehension today. But uh, one thing we know for sure, Lord, that you are a God of love. You care for us. You have made every provision. You've predetermined those provisions for us so that, Father, we can finally be in you and live in you in peace and harmony, joy uh, and happiness. We long for that time. Your kingdom come as we see the pain and misery in the world. We just long and pray, Father, for uh, the fullness of your kingdom to be manifest and established uh, in, in the entire cosmos. So thank you for uh, 
Uh, this time, grant us a good evening and uh, a good day for everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all and look forward to seeing you again.